Life Audio. This is Empowering Homeschool Conversations. We want families to come here and gain insightful strategies that empower them to successfully teach diverse learners at home. Hosted by founder and CEO of Sped Homeschool, Peggy Ployer. Our goal is that these powerful weekly conversations will boost your confidence to cultivate the best at-home learning environment for your student. For more homeschool resources, go to spedhomeschool.com. You're listening to Empowering Homeschool Conversations with Peggy Ployer. We'll start the conversation with Peggy and her guests next. The best-selling illustrative Bible for kids and teens, the Action Bible, is now better than ever. The Action Bible Faith in Action Edition is an interactive Bible specifically created for kids and teens ages 7 to 15. The Faith in Action Edition is designed to engage young readers in God's Word through hundreds of vividly illustrated Bible stories in chronological order with activities and games. Readers will grow in God's Word by using QR codes, providing free access to over 2,000 devotionals, hundreds of prayers, character stories, teaching videos, maps, timelines, and much more. Additionally, the Action Bible Faith in Action Edition allows readers to explore the major themes of the Bible like courage, faith, hope, love, service, trust, and wisdom. Each theme provides practical advice on how to live out God's Word. The Action Bible Faith in Action Edition is the best interactive Bible you can purchase for your child or teen. Purchase your copy today at Sam's Club, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon. Need more of God's power in your life? I'm Christina Patterson, host of the Teach Us to Pray podcast, providing practical tips on how to grow your faith through prayer. Subscribe at lifeaudio.com. This is Empowering Homeschool Conversations, provided by Sped Homeschool, a nonprofit that empowers families to home educate diverse learners. To learn more, visit spedhomeschool.com. Here's Peggy Ployer. Today, we are going to talk about five keys to improve student behavior. And my special guest today is Annalisa Mackey. Annalisa holds a bachelor's degrees in both English and um, um and education and a master's in education. She's been an educator for over 20 years in a variety of school settings. For over 20 years, um, she's also worked specifically with children at risk for developing um, serious behavior problems and training and implementing the paths and preschool programs, which she's going to talk a little bit about today and tell you more about. Um, She's also the author of The Social Emotional Classroom. Welcome, Annalisa. I'm super excited to have you on the show today. Hi, Peggy. It's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And for those of you that are watching um, live, just know that you can be part of this conversation by adding comments, questions in the feed. Um, We are broadcasting live right now on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And so um, wherever you are at, we are happy you are with us, and we would love to have you be part of this conversation. Um, So, Annalisa, as we are getting started, I would just love for you to um, share a little bit about your background and what got you interested in social-emotional learning and helping students with behavior um, struggles? Gosh, well, I'd have to go back quite a ways, actually, Peggy. Um, I, I, I was hired to participate in this, um, uh, this um, program called uh, Fast Track, which was an early intervention program for kids who at, were at risk of developing serious behavior problems like conduct disorder, oppositional huh. defiant disorder, et cetera. And yeah. so I was hired to be the educational coordinator, which was to work with the schools uh, that the, the, the stu- identified students were in. And um, we did sort of uh, two main things on my side of the program. The first was that I worked with the students in a, um, a little group called the Friendship Group. And we worked essentially on social skills, um, emotional skills, helping them to make better decisions and choices, um, helping them get along better with their friends, um, helping them calm down, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, And then the other aspect of my job was to help the school implement a universal social emotional curriculum called PATHS, which stands for Promoting Alternative Thinking Strategies. 
And um, so that was sort of how I ended up getting involved in social emotional learning. And um, what I found was I really enjoyed um, watching the teachers implement the strategies and the program in their classroom and seeing such a dramatic change in the students. Wow. Um, seeing that how they were able to, you know, really little children, you know, be able to stop and calm down and make better decisions and choices, um, know how to make friends and keep friends, hmm. how to initiate play with another child. Cause you don't, right. you think initially that you, you think as a, as a parent or a, a teacher, anybody who's, you know, working with children, you think to yourself, gosh, like, I would think that they would know how to do that sort of just innately. Mm. They don't. I remember right. my very, I remember my very first teaching job. It was um, teaching um, in a school and uh, it was, in, and it was a grade, a combination of kindergarten, grade one and grade two. And my very first day I said to the kids, okay, guys line up at the door so that we can go outside for recess. And I turned around to grab my coat and I turned back to the door and they were just all kind of milling around. And it's huh. at that moment I realized they don't, they don't know how to line up. They don't hmm. know what that means. Right. You know, and I just assumed that when you said line up, they would know that. So, you know, it really, it was a real eye opener for me that a lot of things that you sort of assume you know how to do children mm -hmm. would know how to do. And in fact, that's not true. You have to actually teach them how to do those things. And as parents, I'm sure everybody realizes that it might come as a surprise to them too at times, right? Like, oh, I didn't know you didn't know how to do that. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They, they kind yeah. of catch us off guard and then we don't know what to do. We kind of react, but, but yeah, yes, yeah. And it goes back to, do, are we thinking, have we taught this? Or are we assuming, and I love that you use that word, assuming, that, um, that that was just part of something that was already learned or innate that um, should have been there in the first place. But, but everything is learned. But I think a everything lot of times they'll, they'll pick it up without the, the, um, the focused teaching component part of it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think just for some kids or some experiences, maybe all the kids in that classroom just had never experienced that. I think maybe from our generation, um, we mm -hmm. got more of that lining up type of thing, <laughs> you know, taught mm -hmm. to us, um, yeah. and even younger age too. And, and so, so yeah, there's, there's just so many components involved in there that, um, we can miss if we come to a lot of assumptions. I agree. And I think, you know, what, the thing that really, um, is a big takeaway for me is a lot of children, when you see them misbehaving, it's oftentimes not, it's not, it's not because they want to misbehave. No right. child wants to get in trouble. They don't want to misbehave. That's, it's not, um, it, it's not an active thing that they're trying to, trying to do. It oftentimes comes down to a lack of skill a lack of learning, yeah. a lack of understanding and a lack of practice enough so that they can mm. do what you're right. asking them to do. And I think a lot of times as adults, like again, going back to, we assume that they know how to do this and we assume that just they should have, or, or they should have picked it up by watching other people do it or, right. or watching us do it or watching their siblings do it or, or, or their, or, or their, you know, other, other students around them. And that's mm -hmm. not, not always the case. Not right. always every skill is intuitive and that you can look, just, you know, sort of pick it up by watching other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes we have to be very um, direct about mm -hmm. what we want our students to learn uh, or our children to learn and have conversations with them about our expectations about how to go about doing something yes. um, and what they can expect. Oftentimes yeah. we'll, mm -hmm. as adults too, we'll throw them into a circumstance and think they should just swim. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> mm, not always. Not the <laughs> There's a lot no. of sinkers out there. Yes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. 
Um, I have an example of that when um, our Mm -hmm. youngest was uh, quite young, very young. She was very young. She was about maybe 18, two years old, about two, I would think, two years old. And I thought to myself, I've got to run to the grocery store and, you know, get some groceries for Uh dinner and family, right? And I had picked her up from um, um, her her preschool. And um, I thought, I'll just run to the grocery store. And so I pulled into the parking lot, uh, got her out of her car seat, plopped her into the little cart, the grocery cart, Mm -hmm. and zipped into the store. Uh, And, you know, uh, she was tired and wanted a snack. And that wasn't really, you know, what she was expecting to have to do. uh, Here, all of a sudden, we're in the grocery store now. And she's not real happy about sitting in that cart. And um, I didn't really talk to her about what the expectations were, how long we're going to be in there for, or anything like that. And uh, so, of course, you know, Unfortunately, she had this big meltdown in the grocery store. It mm. was really, as a, you know, as a parent, you know, you're embarrassed and um, mortified and, you know, thinking, yeah. oh, my gosh, this is just really terrible. So I ended up leaving with no groceries. And, of oh. course, she was upset. I was frustrated. It was a bad mm-hmm. situation. Yeah. And then that night, while I was laying in bed thinking about it, I thought, well, gosh, that was not fair, really. Mm of her, of me. I I didn't talk to her about it. I didn't talk about expectations. She didn't know what was going to happen. And, you know, she was, and she had some big feelings about what's about about the situation that I wasn't Mm -hmm. really respecting either. Hmm. And the next thing, you know, things went badly. So the next morning when I woke up, I said to her, you know, Han, I need to apologize because I think we had a bad experience yesterday and I know that you are really capable of going to the grocery store and doing a really great job. But let me talk to you about what the rules are. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, we talked about, well, you know, when you go to the grocery store, when you're little, you sit in the cart mm-hmm. and you don't yell when you're in the, sitting in the cart, you talk with a quiet voice and you don't grab things off the shelf. Because, you know, they're close to the shelf, right? Right, exactly. (laughs) And so we talked about that. And then, you know, a couple of days later, I said, let's go to the grocery store. And so on the way to the grocery store, we talked about what it was going to look like. We we talked about the three rules. I got her out of the car. I got her out of the car. Out of the car. And we were, as we're walking and holding her little hand, every time we took a step, what's rule number one? We sit in the cart. What's rule number two? We don't yell. What's rule number three? We don't grab things off the shelf. Great. Mm-hmm. And then we got to the, got to the carts It plopped her in. I said, great job. Rule number one, check. Right. And then we're in the store. I also realized you can't get a full cart of groceries with a two-year-old. Right. <laughs> so only get, so, only get a, a few things. So, so those were some rules on your side too. <laughs> on my side too. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, we, we got, got the groceries. She was, did a great job, went through the mm-hmm. checkout line on the way back to the car. I said to her, I'm so proud of you. You did a great yes. job. You're an awesome shopper. You know, little grin from ear to ear. Yeah. I think that's sometimes what happens. We don't prepare them. Um, mm-hmm. We don't take into consideration, you know, the big feelings that they might be having at the time. Absolutely. Um, yes. And things go badly. And it's not, it's, it's sometimes it's just about preparing being prepared for the situation and it's hard it's It's hard as parents and teachers to always Mm -hmm. be prepared you don't real necessarily always realize you need to be prepared in that situation until you have the experience Mm -hmm. yeah and I think that's where behavior comes in is if we can Mm -hmm. look at behavior as an indication that training needs to be put in place and I think that was a huge that was a game changer for my parenting when I realized Mm -hmm. the the behavior shouldn't be my point of frustration it should be my point of waking up and yes, when i was it's your call to action that, right that mental shift i was like oh now i i get it um it's the child isn't supposed to have this innately figured out that's my job <laughs> to help with that um but but this is the wake up moment the training mm-hmm. needs to happen and so mm-hmm. i'm super excited for you to share with us these five keys to improve student behavior because they mm-hmm. are things that we can use when we have those wake up moments 
to then say, Mm -hmm. okay, where, what components can we train in to Mm -hmm. actually start giving this child the, the equipment and the, the understanding that they need to go in successfully. Um, Agreed. So. After a word from our sponsor, we'll dive back into this conversation. The best-selling illustrative Bible for kids and teens, the Action Bible, is now better than ever. The Action Bible Faith in Action Edition is an interactive Bible specifically created for kids and teens ages 7 to 15. The Faith in Action Edition is designed to engage young readers in God's Word through hundreds of vividly illustrated Bible stories in chronological order with activities and games. Readers will grow in God's Word by using QR codes, providing free access to over 2,000 and devotionals, hundreds of prayers, character stories, teaching videos, maps, timelines, and much more. Additionally, the Action Bible Faith in Action Edition allows readers to explore the major themes of the Bible like courage, faith, hope, love, service, trust, and wisdom. Each theme provides practical advice on how to live out God's Word. The Action Bible Faith in Action Edition is the best interactive Bible you can purchase for your child or teen. Purchase your copy today at Sam's Club, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon. Are you concerned about tensions in the Middle East? Do you wonder where we're currently at in the biblical timeline? Are we really in the last days? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Carl Muller with the Inside the Epicenter podcast. Every week, my co-host, best-selling author Joel Rosenberg, and I answer those questions and more. You'll hear inside knowledge of our meetings with leaders at the highest levels of government in the U.S., Israel, and the Middle East, equipping you to filter the news with biblically sound insights. Find Inside the Epicenter on your favorite podcast app or go to joshuafund.com to listen and subscribe. This is Empowering Homeschool Conversations, provided by SPED Homeschool. Go to spedhomeschool.com to get resources and support for teaching your unique learner at home. Here with us, um, number one, what is is the first key? Number one is self-awareness. Being able to understand that you have feelings um, and to understand what those feelings are. So knowing what they're called Um, A lot of children only come to school knowing about four or five feelings. Usually it's happy, sad, mad, scared. Yeah, Mm. happy, sad, mad, scared. And that, as as an adult, you know that there are many, 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 many more feelings that we can feel. But if you don't have the word for it, you can't think about it in any way. So... Um, first thing would be in terms of your self, self-awareness for helping your child be more self-aware is to talk about different feelings, what they feel like, what they're called, and yes. maybe even times that you might feel that way. Huh. Not necessarily, there's never always um, a, a hard and fast rule about, you know, well, if you're getting an ice cream cone, you're happy. And if um, you have to go to bed early, you're sad. Like, that is not the, always yeah, the exactly. case. Exactly. <laughs> I think making sure ki- children understand that there are generally things. So eating something that you enjoy, for example, might make you happy. Yes. Um, doing something that you weren't expecting, um, that you were, and you were hoping to be able to do, uh, maybe might make you sad. So mm-hmm. do, I would talk about it more in generalities. Um, That's a good point. Yeah. I, I, because I'm an English teacher as well, I really loved to be able to introduce different emotions through stories. Uh, And I think that is a really great opportunity for parents, especially to be able to um, talk about new feelings by trying to find a story that talks about that emotion. Um, I would also urge you to share times that you have felt that way. Um, it, mm. it builds your relationship um, right. with your child uh, and um, it helps make that connection even stronger to share experiences and then to ask if, if they might have felt that way before. Mm-hmm. So self-awareness is really important. Um, also, not uh, also understanding that our bodies, our physical bodies play a huge role in how we feel. Um, yes. if, if, and 
you know, we under sort of, we sort of understand that when our children are really little, but we kind of, I think, forget about that as our, as children get older. That is true. So, yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, are they getting a good sleep? Hmm. Because mm-hmm. sleep impacts how we feel, how we're able to think, you know, it it is, it's hugely impactful. So sleep is something that you want to consider and talk Mm -hmm. to your children about making sure that they get a good sleep because it will make them feel better emotionally as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Being able to, are they getting good exercise? Mm-hmm. exercise is really, really important. And I know that in today's world, a lot of children are not getting the type of en- enough exercise. Right. But exercise also really affects our mental well-being. Mm-hmm. So we need to think about exercise as well. Food, the quality of the food that we're eating. Um, mm-hmm. If you don't, you know, if, I know as, as a teacher, if when children came to school, if they hadn't hadn't had good sleep, if they hadn't um, eaten very, eaten very well, um, if they were dealing with a lot of emotional things, Mm -hmm. they just aren't ready to learn. Right. Because they're, they're not, they're not at at a good starting place. So understanding, you know, being self-aware of, do I, am I getting good sleep? Am I eating well? Am I getting some exercise? Hydration, to drink mm. enough water. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Especially you and I were talking earlier before this started. I live in Arizona <laughs> and you know, yeah. you're living in Texas. And, you know, we have had a tremendous amount of heat, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You know, is everybody, you're not, are you dehydrated, right? Right. That's, yeah. These are basic, basic things. But I think that we forget about how important they are to how we feel and how we feel then drives how we behave. Right. Mm -hmm. So these are some fundamental things that we can think about. And that is really about self-awareness, being able to, you know, think about how you're feeling, how you, how you are emote physically. Mm -hmm. And, and those two things play a role. I think we often think sometimes that our brain and our body are separate. (laughs) Oh no. Yes. Until you have like something like pain that you deal with and then you Mm -hmm. you realize, Oh, I can't do anything when I'm in this pain. Yes. And that, but for some reason we forget that again when we're, we're not feeling that anymore. But yeah. And those two things are together. We are one human body and, Mm -hmm. um, our brains, um, from the moment we are actually before we're born, our brains start to create, get, get, gather information and it starts to create what we call concepts. And Hmm. from those concepts, our brains make predictions about a lot of different things. And from those predictions, some of those predictions are emotion, but all Hmm. that information that, that goes into these concepts, it's our past experiences, our present experiences and all of our information from our body, which is called allostasis. And the purpose of our brain entirely, the whole purpose is to keep this body alive and functioning. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, um, we need to consider the whole body when we're thinking about these things as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's, it's, it's hard to, to think when a child reacts that it wasn't just their, their thinking that caused that reaction, but it was, Mm -hmm. you know, it could be a variety of different things. I mean, you have to be like a detective um, to sometimes get down to the bottom of what was causing it. Cause I know a lot, you know, a lot of our parents have like kids with sensory issues. And Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, it would be the lights in the room. Maybe they smell it. I had a child that was super sensitive to smell and it did, it took me the longest time to realize his behavior was related to what I was cooking. Um, And you know, and it was like, Oh, you know, you get those wake up moments and you go, Oh, well we can change this. Um, But, but it is, sometimes it it does require some detective work, right? Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. I think that's true. We, we, we learn that when, you know, we're brand new parents, um, mm. or you bring home that baby, um, and 
you know, you're now responsible for keeping this infant alive. And, (laughs) you know, doesn't come with a manual, as we all know. Um, We wish we wish it did, but it doesn't. And so you got to figure it out. And each child is different. Some uh-huh. have more sensitivities to things than others. Some, you know, and it, it, it all, you work, you work to try to figure it out. But when they're really, really little, you really tend to, tend to focus on the physical nature of the, bo- of the baby rea- right. um, manifesting itself as an emotion, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so are they hungry? Are they tired? Are they wet? Are they bored? Have they been sitting in the mm-hmm. same place? You know, like all like those are really basic things um, that we start to, you know, when the child is fussy, right. we start to go, okay, what's wrong? And you go through your start to go through your little checklist of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Those often are very physical things, and the yes. physical things are manifesting themselves emotionally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we yes. never lose that. It's just, we move to another level. And is that where self-management kind of comes in to the yes. picture? Okay. And, and so let's, yes. let's move on to that and, and talk a little mm-hmm. bit about what self-management number two is. Number two. So again, the purpose of the brain is to manage the body. Or I like to call it the body budget, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, we have to take care of those fundamental things and working with our concepts is one of the ways to help ma- manage self-aware self-management or deal with self-management. Um, I always suggest that you have a structure for um, teaching your child how to uh, calm down and then move into a problem solving strategy. So, you know, there's lots of different options out there, but the basics are really this. You want to help your child stop, Mm -hmm. calm down in some way. Oftentimes it's taking a deep breath. It might be going and sitting in a quiet place. It might Mm -hmm. be, uh, if they're really, really upset, they might, you might want to give them some opportunities to get that physical frustration out, like maybe punching a pillow or going Mm -hmm. for a walk we're listening to some music. There's a lot of different ways that you can help yeah. your child calm down and you need to, and, and it's great to be able to, um, figure out what works for them Yes. and, yep. and not in that and have a different, a couple of different options because what might work at home might not work out on the playground. It might not work at the mall. Or, yes. So, because you, you know, different areas, you, that they, there's restrictions in what you can do, mm-hmm. can, can and can't do. So having some different choices for the way that they can calm down is really, really helpful. Yeah. If you choose breathing, I would encourage you to teach them breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. Mm-hmm. When they're little, you can teach them to smell the flower and blow out the candle. Yeah. So that is a, a calming strategy for children. And then once they're calm, they need to think about how they're feeling. What are the feeling words that are coming up for them? Hmm. And then what, what ways can they solve that problem? I mean, if they're super happy, there's nothing to really solve, right? That's great. You're happy. <laughs> but, if right. you're ex- but if you're really, if you're overexcited, you can also get into a situation where you misbehave because you're overly excited. Right. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. Right. So comfortable feelings might not always um, mean, mean, mean that you need to um, go into that self-regulation strategy, mm-hmm. but to oftentimes more uncomfortable feelings are the things that drive it, but right. sometimes comfortable, comfortable feelings that get you overly excited can, can, can drive that too. Right. And they can take guards down that should be up like to right. just for, for safety and boundaries and all those, those things that, um, that the children should naturally have, um, or that we should teach them, <laughs> but, Definitely. um, mm-hmm. but, 
but yes, but yeah, when the child is excited, they'll sometimes approach strangers and then, you know, yeah, that puts them in a, a place of danger. And so, it so could, yes, yes, I, that, that is, it's something to think about is where, where are those mm-hmm. emotions taking you? <laughs> yeah, yeah abs- absolutely. Absolutely. And what are you, dr- what are, what are the decisions that you're making as a consequence of those, mm-hmm. of those, um, those emotions. So Mm -hmm. then the next thing is, well, what can you do to solve this problem? And what I would really encourage adults when you're working, when you're helping children to learn how to problem solve effectively is to, I mean, all of us as adults, when you're working with kids, we kind of know what the answer should be because we've been there before, right? (laughs) We've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, but, Mm -hmm. um, Kids can't learn very well if we're constantly telling them what to do. Yes. And we're so, and we as adults, parents, educators, you know, we, we want children to be able to go out into the world and make great decisions and choices Mm -hmm. on their own. Right. Without us having to sort of second guess them all the time. Mm -hmm. And they're never going to be able to do that if we don't give them a chance to, right. to, to problem solve. And when l- kids are learning how to do that, when they're really little, they're little kid problems. They're not giant problems. Yes. They're not catastrophic yes, problems. So good. Mm-hmm. So you, you want them to start l- with the little problems and build because yeah. adult problems mm-hmm. can be really hard. And right. And you want, want that to be their first decision-making process. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Like you were talking about how your daughter's gone away to college and gosh, Mm -hmm. you don't want her. That's, you don't want that to be the first time she has to make a decision on her own. Right. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So when we're, when we're getting to that step of what can I do to solve that problem? We Mm -hmm. really want, I really would encourage you to listen to the different choices that they might come up with and then have them ask the question, is this going to make the problem better or is this going to make the problem worse? Right. And mm. if it's going to make the problem better, that's a reasonable, um, uh, you know, uh, way to solve the problem. If right. it's going to make the problem worse, it's probably not a good choice. And then we mm. can sort of cross that one off the list. I would encourage you to give them a chance though, because sometimes they might come up with a solution to a problem that we would have chosen, right? But maybe, maybe it works for them. Mm-hmm. Right? That's so and, true. Yep. You know, you're trying to also when you're giving them an opportunity to problem solve, it also builds their self confidence and self esteem and belief in themselves Absolutely. that they can they can solve problems themselves. They are competent individuals. They're capable mm-hmm. and. They, they, they know how to do this. They got this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that confidence, that underlying confidence is, is so important. And and you can't teach that. You have to, to continue uh, to allow that to, to progress. And, and so just by providing those opportunities, you're building that, that ability in themselves to say, I can make good decisions. I can, I can yeah. figure out how to solve these problems. And they're not going to go in with as much anxiety. I think we see so much anxiety in kids yes. because we do take that decision-making um, ability away from them. And we just tell yes. them this is right and this is wrong. Um, yes. And instead of all, you know, trusting that they're, they're going to make good choices and they want to make good choices, but they have they to do. know how to make good choices. Right. And that's trial, a lot of trial and error, unfortunately, it's, as all of us have probably learned in our lives. <laughs> it is. It's a lot of trial and error. And it starts when they're really, really little, mm-hmm. really little. I mean, as, as, as when we're, when we're working with little children, we often give them, you know, we'll give them two choices. You can do this or you can do this, right. but we're giving them an option. You know, Mm -hmm. and as we get older, as they get older, we want to maybe take a step back from giving them the choices and let them come up with some choices on their own that might work. Mm -hmm. And then, Mm -hmm. and again, that, that question of, is this going to make the problem better or worse? That sort of provides the little guide rails, but it still, it still allows them the ability to be engaged in the process of making the decision. We're not telling them what to do. We're allowing Mm -hmm. them to make the decision with support. 
Yes. And I think Absolutely. that yeah. mm-hmm. because we, at the, at the end of the day, as you, as they get older, we want to be able to, you know, take a step back and allow them to make those decisions and choices on their own. Absolutely. And at the same time, we still want to be there for them. If they need something, something I know, like, like I said, I have our, 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 our three girls are, um, they all are on, on their own now. They've, you know, um, they have families, they, you know, they're living all over the world now they're doing their own thing, but I still want them to be able to come and talk to me about something if they feel they need to. Yeah. And at the same time, have the ability to feel that they have the confidence uh, mm. to be able to make the decisions that they, they know they need to. Right. Yes. So Absolutely. that's part of, that's definitely part of self-management. Mm-hmm. Um, and going back to the self-awareness piece, knowing what you're feeling when you're feeling it is key because if you remember when I was talking about the steps to problem solving, asking mm-hmm. how I'm feeling about the situation is crucial. Yes. Mm-hmm. So those two things are very intricate, intricately connected. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And then the next step you talked about mm-hmm. is social awareness. Um, right. And so how mm-hmm. does, yeah. How do we then move towards that? So social awareness is really um, kind of being aware of other people that mm-hmm. we, they all, like, we all don't think and feel the same way about stuff. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, um, it's interesting as children, you know, when you, when you start off, like when you watch your, your child, children grow, you, re- you realize that they, there's a point at which they recognize that other people don't think the way they do. Right. Um, and that's, often where you go from when the children are doing that parallel play kind of thing where they're sitting mm-hmm. side by side and kind of playing to when they sort of turn face each other and start to try to interact with each other. Right. That, when that happens, that's when they're all of a sudden there's some, you know, um, discord. And the reason there's yeah. discord is because they're learning that not everybody thinks the way they do. <laughs> yes. Right. Yep. And that, that can be upsetting, but it's a huge learning opportunity as well. <laughs> it's, it's definitely, it's necessary, right? Mm-hmm. Because we don't live in isolation. I mean, we right. all know what that was like the last few years living right, exactly. in isolation <laughs> and how hard that really, and how hard that really was for everybody. Right. Mm-hmm. We, we live in, um, we are social beings. We learn to be social. Um, and we, we, we depend on, our social nature for a number of different things. Uh, So social awareness is key. We learn to be social um, between, because of the parent, uh, the the caregiver infant bond, Hmm. Um, that bond teaches the infant that another human being helps to regulate their body. The caregiver teaches them when to go to sleep. They feed them. They, clothe them, they change them, they regulate their body heat. Are they warm? Are they cold? We learn that socialization impacts our bodies, which yeah. also impacts how we feel. Hmm. So mm-hmm. social awareness is extremely, extremely important. Now, um, how do we interact with each other? Well, we learn that not everybody's the same and we have to start trying to respect how other people think and feel because right. of our social nature. Um, it's one thing I really want to highlight here is that oftentimes we think that we can read people really well, you know, right. Just because someone has a, a lot of reflection yeah. off of us <laughs> that we're reading. <laughs> oh my gosh. That is, that is so true, Peggy. You know, we, um, we, we cannot read other people well, right? Just because somebody has a smile on their face does not mean they're necessarily happy mm-hmm. just because they don't, some, uh, someone doesn't look like they're listening to us. Doesn't mean they haven't heard every single word we said, right? You know, um, body language, facial expression. The only way we can really tell how that other person is feeling is if we ask, and yeah. they choose to answer truthfully. Mm, that's They're, a very good caveat to the end of that. Yes, mm-hmm. that's so true. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, how many times do we, we have people say to us, oh, how are you feeling today? And you say, fine. Mm-hmm. Does that fine ever really encompass how you're feeling? Right. You know, so social awareness is really important. Um, it's also social, social cue, like, you know, knowing sort of how to interact in, 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 in social groups that can be difficult for some children. And mm-hmm. that often takes a lot of practice and support. So yes. getting a chance to be in a, in a, in a, in, a, in, in groups, I know sometimes, um, parents might feel that because their child struggles with that, that they will just remove themselves them from that situation so that they don't have to struggle. Hmm. And while I understand that desire to, to, to protect your child and to, um, you know, prevent them from feeling strong, uncomfortable emotions, um, it's really important for them to learn how to be social. And so there has to, we have to find ways for them to be able to enter s- social situations and learn how to interact well. Um, that can be, uh, that can be managed for them. You know, mm. maybe, maybe not throwing them into a group of 20 kids, that might be too hard. Right. But yep. maybe, maybe setting up a play date with another child with mm-hmm. some support. And when they, you know, get um, a little bit of skill in that area, then, you know, add another child to the group, slowly, right. slowly interact, inter, in, you know, put them into situations where they can flourish um, right. and grow from those experiences. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think would, that's so true. That's it, yeah. we, we just kind of, it's, we, we imagine socialization is, is a one type of category. It's, you know, a, a child in a group of 20 to 30 and, and yet it can be oh. with one friend. And, and as mm-hmm. we become adults, I think we're, we're more involved in those types of interactions as the one, two, three people, not groups of 20, you know, that's, that's more rare. Um, but those are the skills we're going to use longer anyways, but, and those become mm-hmm. more personal and more deep and that requires, I think even more social skills, um, yeah. Than, than functioning in a, a large group type of setting, but but it's right. it's nice to think of yeah that, that it's mm-hmm. all encompassing social um, that social awareness can happen in a variety of different settings, and definitely uh, you have to learn all those skills from from definitely. Hand. And I think the other piece that I would like to maybe mention is you know um, oftentimes you know we do these play dates now with kids where you have you know the children sitting there and they're playing in front of the parents. You know, mm-hmm. when I was a child, when I went, to, you know, when I was, I, I didn't have, I, there was no such thing as play dates, not, right. not at all. Oh, no. I just, no. when I, when I wanted to play, <laughs> yeah, knocked on the door, yeah. can, can Peggy come out and play, right? You know? Right. Yeah. yeah. And then you went out and played and your parents mm-hmm. were standing around watching you play. Like yeah. mm-hmm. you, you, you figured that stuff out on your own and today it's different. Yeah. But what I think is happening is parents are interjecting themselves into that play so yes. much so that children aren't learning the skills. So when, you know, you're sitting there having a cup of coffee um, and you're, you know, with, with another parent and the children are playing in front of you, when they have a problem, what do the parents do? They'll jump right and in right away. Yeah. Jump right in and fix the problem. Mm. Right. You know what I'd like you, I'd like the parents to do while they're sitting there have a couple of sips of coffee and see if the kids can solve it themselves. Yeah. If they can't solve it themselves, then do the, do this, the problem solving strategy that we talked about, Mm -hmm. get them to stop, calm down. How are they feeling? What is the problem? Right. What could they, how could they fix it? What will they agree to? And then give it a try. Yeah. Yeah. I found the same to be true, even with sibling relationships, you know, with um, a lot of parents will just jump in and, and say, well, you know, my kids are always fighting and it's, you know, it's aggravating me. And I, it's like, I taught my kids a long time ago, this, this is called stop rule we used in our house and somebody had to say it. Um, and if you didn't stop the situation and I had to get involved, you sat in two chairs in the same room and I left again. 
You have to yeah. solve the problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't want you hurting each other, but this is your problem. It's not mine. Um, and wow, did that make my kids learn how to get along? Yeah. And we don't think about that, but it's not so much about me teaching. They have to learn how to work with each other. They do. They absolutely do. It's you know, such and, an important skill. And I think that as uh, we, we think that little, like little children can't learn this, they're, or they're not ready to learn this, they can. Mm -hmm. I've seen oh, children, yeah. you know, as young as in, you know, um, you know kindergarten, be able to stop and go through that process because they've been taught it how to do it. They've gone through and had lots and lots of practice and then yeah. they're able to do it for themselves. Mm -hmm. I've had little kids go, you know what? I think you need to stop and calm down. They'll tell their friends. <laughs> That's great. Right? Yep. And the next thing you know, like they're problem solving and they're working with each other because they have yeah. a structure that they, they know and they're used to using it and, and it works. And it makes yeah. them feel that it builds their self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that really takes yeah. us into that next key is that um, those relationship mm -hmm. skills. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, how, how do you work with other people? Um, you know, and that is also, you know, about how to, how to be a good team, participate on a team, how to be right. a good leader, how to be, mm -hmm. how to, how to, how to win graciously and how to lose graciously. Yes. All of those kinds of things. Um, you know, I see a lot of times, um, in, um, P phys ed classes or um, um, activities uh, that sports activities um, mm -hmm. coaches are often talking about these things a lot and I don't right. think they realize that, that what they're doing is teaching relationship skills mm. they don't really understand they don't they don't really see it that way they think right. they're just coaching the kids and helping them to you know do better in the sport so that they can you know win the game or whatever it is they're doing right but what they're really doing is teaching them how to get along with each other, how to mm -hmm. work well with each other, exactly. how to be successful together. Mm -hmm. So um, those, those skills are crucial as well. And right. I, I really think that it's important for um, children to be able, I mean, we, as adults, when we're working, we don't often work in isolation either. We work yeah, on absolutely. teams, mm -hmm. we work together together. And if we can't do that well, you know, um, oftentimes that really impacts the success that we have in our careers. Oh, absolutely. Because we, we aren't, we can't do everything ourselves. There's other people who have other gifts. And if we don't utilize those gifts that those other people have, and we try to do everything as a one person type of, um, yeah, it, it doesn't work because we can no. only do so much. I mean, I, I love people that love to do budgeting and are detail oriented because that's not me. <laughs> and, I agree. and they love that me that I can be a visionary and not worry about yeah the other things. So and then that, but, yeah, so but, yeah. yeah, but we have to play off. Each we can't do that if we just say, well, I can do it all myself. Um, we're, we're not setting up our kids too for to be successful if exactly. they can't learn how to um, use what they do best and then let other people do what they do best alongside them and, and to be okay with that in, um, and to know yes. how to navigate that as well. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. You know, I think um, you had mentioned that there was a question about perfectionism. Um, yes. Earlier. Yes. Yeah. Think, that was from Mandy. Yeah. I think that really comes into play here. You hmm. know, um, it's really about relationship skills as well as self-awareness and self-management. You know, none of these things are, are in isolation. They all. Right. And uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, um, perfectionism, you know, not everybody is good at everything. And mm -hmm. you as a person are not good at everything. So right. what are you, what can you excel at and be good at? And what can you allow other people to excel at and be good at? Because everybody right. needs to be able to feel that they are good at something. Hmm. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you, as, as much as you want that self-esteem to feel proud of the of things that you are good at, you know, yeah. you also want your friends to feel that same level of pride and confidence 
And so, you know, letting them flourish and shine um, as well as, you know, in the things that they're good at um, and you try to flourish and shine in the things that you are really good at. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes. At the same time, realizing that as self-management, if, if this perfectionism is a pro, when is it a problem? When oh, is it? That's a good point. Yes. Yeah, good when, thing to ask. Getting, yeah. Is this making the problem better or is this hmm. making the problem worse? Right. Mm-hmm. So going back to uh, problem solving this, this potential issue of perfectionism as well. So yeah. again, like I said, as, as we just said, you know, these, these skills don't stand in isolation. They work Absolutely. together. Um, and, and so that, you know, is a, is a, a way to think about working um, or trying to help your child with um, an issue of perfectionism. Yes. Yes. That's so true. As you were talking about that, I was thinking about just how, um, the, again, as a parent jumping back into, you know, trying to solve the problem and, mm-hmm. and then your child, they can't do that with their friends either. Um, and so we have to model that on how do we allow others to fail? How do we allow our child to fail so that our children can allow others to fail? Because they're going to reciprocate that the same way um, in those relationships. And and so if we're going back and we're saying our child is so critical about other people, well, okay, now how, do, how am I critical about them? <laughs> am I teaching the right thing? Mm-hmm. Um, or Or is it something that needs to go back to? you know, what I'm doing and then to reteach them so that they can have, um, just be better equipped for those relationships in the long run. Definitely. Definitely. You know, I, I think, you know, it's not always about coming up with the right answer, mm-hmm. you know, and you know, it, it's okay to be wrong. Yeah. Failure sta- in my world, failure stands for first attempt in learning. Oh, I love that. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, we we're we're always so afraid of our kids to fail or for us to fail. But we but we learn through failure. That's how we learn. And we we make things better through failure. (laughs) We actually invent through failure. (laughs) Yes. That drives creativity and learning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we really have to try to get over this bugaboo of thinking that failure isn't an option. Right. Failure yeah. should be an option. Failure mm-hmm. has to be an option, you yep. know, because we don't, mm-hmm. we don't grow from, from a lot, from, from anything that, that we grow from failure. So, yeah. you know, thinking about um, that as a, as a way to maybe address some perfectionism, the fear, mm-hmm. I think perfectionism could maybe, and I, I, I wouldn't want to speak for every person or every child, but, Perhaps the the drive for perfectionism is push is 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 because of a fear of failure, and so maybe yes. if we're talking about that differently, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's uh, it, it might it might alleviate some of that concern. Yeah, I see it too, and I'm I'm kind of a coach as well, and I see it in my students when I show them something new. Um, oh yeah, got that, you know, and they'll take off, and then when they fail, they come back and say, mm-hmm. "Can you teach me?" that (laughs) because then they realize i don't think i quite got that (laughs) but yeah it it takes them a while to realize oh this is harder than i thought it was and now i'm willing to learn but that failure is so is a very important part of the learning process because it opens up their willingness to listen and to learn something different than they had preconceived as the right way to do something. And so you just, yeah, (laughs) have to embrace it. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to make sure we get to that, the last point. um, Mm -hmm. And, and that is um, responsible decision-making. Right. And I think we've been talking about that one, you know, from the very beginning, as, as I said, you know, it's not, these are not, these these skills do not stand in isolation, Mm -hmm. but it's really about, you know, understanding that we learn from errors. We learn from failures Um, and our brains, as I mentioned, are predicting brains. If they were, if they waited for all the information to come in and then respond, we would always be lagging behind. Right. (laughs) Absolutely. Right. But we, our brains take what we know, what it knows and Mm -hmm. it goes, okay, I think this is what's going to happen. And it predicts, but we learn 
from the prediction errors or the failures. So the yes. brain learns that, okay, so this, this particular guess that mm-hmm. I made was wrong. Mm-hmm. And now I need to adjust my concepts so that then yeah. I can make a better prediction or guess next mm-hmm. time. So if we are always trying to eliminate um, mm-hmm. failure, you're trying to eliminate how you learn. That's, oh, that is profound. Say that again. <laughs> if you try to eliminate failure, you're trying to eliminate how you learn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, we really need to try to help our children understand that, you know, it's not failure. It's yeah. first attempt in learning. Mm. Um, I think... It's really, again, I would, I, I just want to go over the problem solving steps one more time for people. Yeah, yeah, and I'm mm-hmm. not, I'm not going to say that there's um, um, one particular way um, in our programs, um, hmm. in our middle school and high school, we use um, a strategy called scope or scope it in high school scope stands for stop, consider the problem. What are the options? Hmm. Um, then you make a plan hmm. and you evaluate it. Yeah. So that's how, that's how the middle school program works in terms of, and we, we try to give an, a mnemonic device so that kids can remember it. So, um, if I see a child uh, having a difficult time, I go, Hey, I think you need to scope that. Ah, uh, mm-hmm. right? right. And they'll, they'll go, Oh yeah, that's right. And then they go back to the steps that they know. Um, uh-huh. and you know, sometimes I've had, I've had our kids also say to me, uh, you know, I think we should scope this, right? Mm-hmm. But it gives them that right. language, though, um, mm-hmm. to be able to to say, you know, this this is where I think the next step should go versus, right. you know, just I'm floundering here and how do we work this out? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah. and then expecting the adults in their life to just tell them what to do. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In, in high school, we add on to that. We talk about uh, the scope again you know, stop, consider the problem options, make a plan, evaluate. But then Mm -hmm. we add IT. The I stands for insight. What what did they learn here? And Uh then T stands for transformation. How Mm -hmm. is that information that I've learned? How am I going to take that in? And how is that going to change who I am as a person? Does it, you know, do I want to be the kind of person that does X, Y, or Z? And so, you know, it helps what we're trying to do is help them to realize that the experiences that they have, the decisions that they make all go into who they become as people. Right. And we would hope what what we'd like to see is that it's intentional Mm. more than just a, it has happened. Right. Right. You know, Mm -hmm. are you who you want to be? Because you can take some responsibility and 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 part- and participate in who you become. Exactly, and and that it's the influence that they're choosing to exert, mm-hmm. um, and and they have to realize that that's a choice. It's, it's not choice. just it, it's not just I'm I'm just going with the flow, and this is what's happening to me. No, you have a choice, yeah. and you have yes, a choice to either change the direction or trajectory of what's going on or to go along with it. And, and what do you have the power to do? And yeah, but all of these things that you've been talking about that adds up to, you know, this, this whole behavior is, is coming. um, And from, from things that we have to, we have to get to the bottom of um, even self, self understanding um, and, and then taking that to that choice level. So it's, it's that regression, but internalizing it. And we do have to do it mm-hmm. so quickly. And so that practice, 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 like you've been talking yeah. about is just what's required. It's key. It's really key. Um, mm-hmm. when, and, and, you know, um, I think as, 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 as we get older, we kind of, I don't know, I, I hate, I hate to say this, but I think we sort of stop being in, um, introspective, you know, we just kind of go with the flow, think we've got it and move it on. Right. I, yeah. I've been there, done that and learned everything yeah. I can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. it's not a good attitude to have. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a growth mindset. It's not mm-hmm. a learning mindset. We right. need to think about the fact that we are learning 
and we're working on being a better person Mm -hmm. from the moment we are born until the day we take our last breath. And, you know, that is, it's, it's, it's a lifelong journey, um, but there's skills that we can learn that can help us along the way and practice, practice, practice. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Annalisa. This was an amazing discussion. I'd love for you to talk just a little bit about the PATH program that you touched on. Um, And I know you also offer um, options to homeschool pods and learning groups. And so, um, so that's something our, our viewers especially would be interested in, but Mm -hmm. just give an overview of the PATH program and then what um, homeschoolers also can take advantage of. Right. So we have uh, programs from uh, preschool to uh, grade 12. Our program from preschool to grade five is called the PATH program, promoting alternative thinking strategies. Our middle school program is, and high school program is called the MOSI. Um, and uh, they are both pr- programs that teach these, the skills that we've been talking about, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship management, and responsible decision-making. Mm. Um, they uh, start off teaching these skills when they're really little. And then as kids get more experience, we build on them. Uh, the program deals uh, talks about issues that children are facing at the age that they're at so that oh, we give them the skills good. that they can to be able to address the things that they're facing at the time that they're in that, in that mm-hmm. age range. Mm-hmm. Um, what's nice about our programs is that um, we're, we're, they're more um, preventative hmm. uh, rather mm-hmm. than reactive. So we we start off by teaching them about emotions, their emotions. We start off by giving them a self-regulation strategy so that when they mm-hmm. have these issues, Right. They already have had the skills. We've already talked about them. And now when they come up against some of these things, there it's an opportunity to practice, not a, a yes. first opportunity to learn the issue, learn the skill, and then mm-hmm. have um then and then have less than optimal results. So these are preventative um, mm-hmm. programs. And what's nice is that they often they can be taught um, you know on a one-on-one situation, but Mm. more often it's better if they're in a small group because then the children can talk amongst themselves about what they think about the situation, Mm. get other people's perspectives, other children's perspectives, other like-minded perspectives as Mm -hmm. well. And, and, and and also different ideas around the situation. Um, And then they can learn to how to, how to work together as well at at the same time. So if you have learning pods, this is a great opportunity to do something like this with those, with those small groups. Yeah. And I'll share both of those um, links on the the show notes um, in in the description on YouTube, as well as the podcast. Um, But it's pathsprogram.com and then pathsprogram.com forward slash home dash school. Um, So you can find out more information about all of those those things and those resources that uh, Annalisa and Paths provides. Well, thank you so much. This was an amazing conversation. I I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm sure our viewers um, will too as as they pop in. A lot of them popped in live. We were quiet today, Um, but but that's okay. I I saw lots of hearts and and things going on. So, um, but but yes, um, and then this will be available in the podcast in a couple weeks. So I'm excited for that too. But um, thanks for kicking off our, our month that we're talking about behavior. This was a, a good way to, to launch into that. And I appreciate all of your insight and everything that you shared today. Thanks so much for the opportunity, Peggy, to talk to um, your audience. I, I hope I was helpful. I yeah. hope that, um, <laughs> you know, there was some n- nuggets of wisdom that people were able to take away. And I hope everybody yeah. just has a wonderful, wonderful day and a great so October. Yes, I know. We're launching into a new month. And that means, yep, we have a new um, new theme. And next week, we're going to talk about executive functioning behavioral intervention strategies for parents. So you'll want to join us back for that um, episode, same time, same place. And um, until then, everybody, thanks for being part of our community. Check out our resources at spedhomeschool.com. And God bless. And we'll see you all next week. Bye, everybody. 
take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on this podcast. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you'll find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and more. This has been Empowering Homeschool Conversations with Peggy Ployer. Finding uplifting news in today's headlines is often like searching for a needle in a haystack. At the Story Behind podcast, we believe in the power of finding heartwarming tales and are happy to share empowering stories with you every week. Hear about how Steve Harvey surprised a dying man on Family Feud with $25,000. Get inspired by the note a waitress received from a patron dining alone. And even hear about how one VIP passenger made a hardworking pilot get emotional before his flight. To start listening to the Story Behind podcast, visit lifeaudio.com or search Story Behind on your favorite podcast platform.